Let's do this together. And just pray this with me. Say, say, Jesus, take my heart and let it be forever closed to all but thee. Seal thou my breast and let me wear the pledge of love forever there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm happy to hang out with you guys for a little bit. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to preach or teach or anything. I'm just going to talk with you from my heart, if that's okay. Um, because we know that the gospel itself is, is nothing but the charming voice of the bridegroom. It's just him and his love desiring to have us and and to enjoy us. It's this is what it's all about. And um, with evangelists, sometimes I think that uh, we forget that evangelists are just heralds that have come forth from the king's chamber, <laughs> uh, having been with, having seen, having touched, having experienced. I know you've read the book of Acts when the apostles say, we can't stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. <laughs> uh, I think a, a lot of times people can't start speaking because they haven't seen or heard anything. <laughs> but it's the, ex the experience of this beautiful, glorious bridegroom, the sight of his charms, his infinite charms, and the hearing of his charming voice, it causes us to desire and delight to share his love with others because we've drank of it ourselves. So that's the goal of, of this time. I just want to remind us of that uh, because it's, it's easy to get into format and get into ministry method and thought processes like that and forget that this whole thing is just Prince Charming and Cinderella dancing on a stage together eyeball to eyeball fingertip to fingertip god in, and man in love with one another that's what this whole thing is it ends with a bride and a bridegroom that he would captivate all the affections and that he would captivate the fullness of your heart and, and that you would be able to say like jonathan edwards said prayer seemed to be natural to me the breath by which the inward burnings of my heart had vent is a flame of love so hot on the inside that it just begins to come out through worship and praise and preaching and prayer it is constantly coming out because there's a, a flame of love on the inside you know you've read through the book of song of solomon i'm sure and you see that they think that the entire world is like a stage for their love. <laughs> they are so overtaken with one another and so fixed on each other. She's just looking for direct contact with him. Let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. And he's longing to gaze upon her. Let me see your, your face. Let me, let me hear your voice. Uh, the longing for one another. And, and this is what we have in, in the gospel. And it's what the gospel brings people into. Uh, so I had three major points that I wanted to touch on. And, and the first one is, is button. The second one is string. And the last one is diamond. Um, if you turn over in your, in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, we'll talk about the button first. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Again, I know you guys have all read these, these things before, but may they be a stirring up of your pure mind by way of remembrance. May they be a safeguard to you, as Peter says. I, I don't worry about telling you guys the same things again, Peter writes, because it's a safeguard for you. So one nine, it says this. It says, uh, God is faithful. I love that. <laughs> First three words get me. <laughs> God is faithful. <laughs> Praise God. It's not about my faithfulness. It's about his faithfulness. He's the faithful one in the relationship. Praise God. <laughs> God is faithful. And it says, through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise God. So you have that it's based on this calling is 
into fellowship, and it's based on God's faithfulness. <laughs> I love that because there's times in my heart where I don't feel faithful. Uh, there's times in my heart where I've missed the mark. And the call to fellowship is not based on my faithfulness. In other words, I don't get this fellowship because I've been good enough. I get this fellowship because God is good. God is faithful. And he's the calling one. He's invited you in by his faithfulness, resting upon the foundation of his goodness. He's called you into fellowship with his son. Fellowship implies uh, mutual delight. <laughs> fellowship implies communication. Fellowship implies uh, presence, voice. I remember reading uh, a wonderful book by J.B. Stoney, and he said, nothing satisfies love but company. <laughs> what a great statement. It's so true. Not just in a marital relationship and a love relationship, but our love relationship with the Lord. Nothing satisfies love but company. I need your presence, God. I need your presence. I long for your presence, God. You here, you can give me all the gifts in the world. If I don't have your presence, I'm empty. I need your presence, Lord. That's what I desire. Fellowship is presence. Fellowship is interactive presence. And you have been invited, called into interactive, glorious presence exchange with Jesus. <laughs> You've been called into this. Praise God. And again, to reiterate, it's not because you're good. It good. It's, let me just save the suspense. You're never going to be good enough to deserve such access to God. <laughs> I just cut the suspense right there and say, none of this is based upon me. Listen, you can't bank on your own consistency. You'd be like, yes, I'm consistent. I pray every day. Therefore, I have access to God greater than others. Nobody has greater access to God than you. Why? Because in the gospel, he didn't just crack the door open for some and open it for others. He removed the door off the hinges based on his own perfect work, we are received by God fully and completely. Each one of us called in to interactive, blissful enjoyment, presence, fellowship, praise God, because of Jesus, because of Jesus. Maybe you feel like, you know, I, you know, I, I have better access now because I haven't, you know, fell in a certain way in a while, or I haven't done that, you know, in a while, or I've, I've been clean, you know, for this uh, amount of time. That's not gospel access. That's works access. And you'll find that you get frustrated real quick because you're entering into another room. <laughs> and that room is the room of works and self-effort. I read from Watchman Nee yesterday. He said, our rest is looking at Christ and not to self. Two things, looking at Christ and not to self. It reminds me of the great Hebrew writer. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He authors it, begins it, and he finishes it. He does the work. He's the keeper of the flame. He's the keeper of your faith. Our only responsibility is to enjoy the beauty of his appearance, <laughs> the wonder of his character, gazing upon him, looking unto Jesus. He authors and finishes our faith. And the word looking in, in Greek is really interesting. It's two words together. We would call that what a compound word. And it is from to, <laughs> when you say looking from to, I look away from self, away from my own works, away from me and the world and others. I look away from to you. I give you all my attention, Lord. I give you all my attention. So this, uh, this first point is button. You say, why, why call it button? <clears throat> well, if you miss the first button on the shirt, no matter how well you and tightly you button the other buttons, they're all wrong. <laughs> this is the first button on the shirt. We miss it here. Everything's off. It doesn't matter how tight you keep things. It doesn't matter how perfectly you button things. The whole thing is off if we miss this, that we have perfect access to God because of Charles Spurgeon said, you stand before God as Christ because 
Christ stood before God as you. <laughs> Imputed righteousness, we enjoy boldness to enter into the throne of grace and we receive and enjoy the sweetness of his presence as uh, a phrase from David Brainerd. You might know that, that the evangelist uh, who went on horseback, you know, to reach the Indians and went through really difficult times uh, in his uh, sickness and persecution and things. But he writes that uh, he says an hour with God infinitely excels all the pleasures and delights of this lower world. <laughs> now, mind you, he's dying of tuberculosis when he writes this. He's coughing up pieces of his lungs. His teeth are probably red from blood. And he writes with a smile, a red smile. An hour with God infinitely excels all the pleasures and delights of this lower world. He loved to use this, uh, this phrase called upper world. <laughs> and he would say in his journal, today I was taken into the upper world. <laughs> and detached from the earth, enjoying the presence of God. If we miss it here, we miss it. The first button on the shirt is perfect access and enjoyment of God. Praise God. You know, this access to God is so precious. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, It is worthwhile to have lived if for nothing else than to have had a half an hour's fellowship with God. <laughs> this fellowship with God is so precious. Robert Murray McShane writes, an hour with God, an hour with God is, is worth a lifetime with any man. A calm hour with God is worth a lifetime with any man. Uh, this is this is that way of being that separates us from everyone else. You know, what, what separates the men from the boys is time with God. You know, some people have sweetness in their life, and it's, it's wonderful because they've submitted to Christ and the gospel. But those that spend time with God, they're fermented, and they become aged wine, very uh, sweet in its... In its uh, fragrance and it's experiential you you begin to take on the nature of the lord you know some people are like juice boxes and then some people are like age blind the difference being time <laughs> being with him you know as ministers you guys are ministers of the gospel as ministers who are set free from the the, the busyness of normal life we have a calling into a fellowship inside of fellowship, if you will, like the scripture says in Acts 6, 4, that the apostles said, we cannot uh, be waiting tables. We must devote ourselves to the word of God and to prayer, devoting ourselves to the word of God and to prayer, but showing that their devotion to God was more important than people. We can't be waiting tables more important than people. Not that they don't love people. It's just God has a higher priority than people. And then also more important than their service, <laughs> which is, you know, we can't be doing this waiting of table serving. So it's people and service. God is above both of them. Not that we don't serve and not that we don't love people. It's just that they must come secondary to God. And that is the ministerial life. That's the life of a fivefold evangelist. He's with God and then goes and tells people about him. He's a herald coming forth from, she's a herald coming forth from the king's chamber, smelling of frankincense and myrrh, having been with him. Praise God. So that's point number one, the button. <laughs> the second point is string. Turn over to um, uh, Second Peter. I think it's Second Peter. Yeah, one. Look at this verse. Again, I know you guys have read this stuff before. But may the Lord, by His Spirit, just quicken it fresh in your life. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse... Let's just read verse uh, 3. Okay, so it says, um, By the righteousness of our God, I love that, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of, and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace. Grace and peace. Two things, grace and peace. 
be multiplied. This is ever increasing. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Hold, hold stop right there. I don't think I, I don't think it's oversimplification to remind us that if you're going to know somebody, you have to fellowship with them. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you facts about Michael Jordan. I can tell you he's six six. He was born February 17, 1963 in Brooklyn, New York. He went to, you know, he played for the Tar Heels. He averaged 37 points a game his third season. I can tell you all kinds of facts. I could tell you his dad was murdered. I could tell you that he's divorced his wife. I could tell you he owns a shoe company. I know all these facts about Jordan, but I don't know Jordan. If I saw him and he saw me, we don't know each other intimately or personally. There's no relationship. A lot of Christians gather facts about God and they log them in their brain and think that that's the knowing of God. But that's not the knowing of God. The knowing of God necessitates experience, as we just talked about, fellowship, exchange, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching. As this, Jesus says in John 8, the Pharisees say two questions to him that are very, they're, they're just astounding questions. Jesus is talking and they say to him, where's your father? <laughs> so the first point of religion is they have no awareness of God's presence. Where, where is your father? <laughs> and number two, they say, who are you to Jesus? Which means that religion has no knowing of Christ. They don't know the presence, know the person of Christ. They have facts and they have theology, living moral, and they got all this order, but they don't have taste, touch, experience. Grace and peace is multiplied to you and to me through the knowing <laughs> the experiential knowing of the Lord, uh, the experience of him is the increase of grace. Now, let me explain what grace is. I love to think about these things, even though I know them, thinking upon them is, is still life. It's almost like when God teaches you something, you can always go drink from that thing. Always. Um, <clears throat> as Thomas Watson said, he said, um, by holy musings, suck the sweetness out of God. By holy musings, suck the sweetness out of God. Now, let me give you another one. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, reading is gathering the grapes. Meditation is eating them. So it does good to read, but reading should be to bring you to meditation. Meditation is holy musings, sucking the sweetness out of God. It is the passing from going into your eyes and letting it into your heart, dropping from brain to blood uh, so that you can experience the thing, taste the thing. You know, until we enter into meditation upon the Lord, what we know will never glow. But if we want what we know to glow, that's going to happen by enjoyment of him meditation upon him, drinking of him, taking his word in and praying through it, letting it cause worship, letting it cause praise on the inside. I say cause because um, it is our side of Christ that makes praise. You know, we don't praise to, to see Christ. We praise because we see Christ. We don't worship to see Christ. We worship because we see Christ. In other words, the side of Christ causes you to say, oh, blessed be your name, Lord. The sight of Christ causes you to say, I worship you and I adore you, Lord. And you say, what's the sight of Christ? Gazing upon him in the word, recognizing his character as he's revealed it, his personhood as he's revealed it. And then by faith, meditating upon those things, taking them into your heart by prayer and lingering there with him. This is that experiential exchange with him where the glories of Christ are recognized and the taste and the touch begins and you pass from knowing about to knowing him. And it becomes that factory of grace. Now, what is grace? Um, well, a good story that helps us understand what grace is. Um, I preached one time at this church in um, Arkansas, and this old man comes up to me <laughs> after I preached on fellowship with God, 
And this old man comes up to me afterwards and he goes, you know, son, when I was your age, he was probably 85 or something. He goes, when I was your age, I, uh, I loved to read the word and, and I loved to pray and I love to preach and, and I love to worship just like you, son. And I said, yeah. And then he goes, I'm still that way to this day. And then he says, you know what that is, son? I said, well, what is it, sir? He says, that's grace. That's grace. Then he says, you're nothing special, son. Grace is special. <laughs> and I love that he said that because it shows us, it shows me, reminds me of what grace is. Grace is God's, not only his unmerited favor, a favor that you didn't earn, but it is power. It is working in you both to will and to do. When I was in Bible college, they turned us to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, and they told us that is the best definition of grace. Good old Bob Phillips told us that. He worked with David Wilkerson in the past. He's, he's gone now. But grace is God working in you both to will and to do. And don't get lost in the rhyme of it. What that means is he puts the desire in you to do what is right and pleasing to him <clears throat> and also gives you the power so the desire and the power and man only yields to this work of the spirit and these things come out of our lives. Grace is multiplied, increasing as we enjoy fellowship with him. Oh, we enjoy sweetness of fellowship with him. How many of you know you need peace in your life? I need peace in my brains. I need peace in my heart because we know this, the world's not going to give us peace it's chaos out there, and it's probably only going to get worse. But we have peace that passes the ability to be understood, peace that passes understanding. It is melting in his peace. It is uh, causing the inwards to be as still as the sea of glass in Revelation. I remember reading from um, one old writer. He said, Jesus' life was lived in turmoil, but inwardly he was a sea of glass. He was still on the inside. <laughs> Praise God. Stillness before the Lord. Be still and know. It's that peace, the absence of confusion, the absence of the darkness of anxieties in multiplicities. It's a singularity. All for thee, Lord. I worship you. This is peace that, that comes from him and is him. He himself is our peace, the scripture says. So now why do we call this one string? Well, there's a uh, book that I recommend to you. It's called Flowers from a Puritan's Garden. It is, uh, I believe it's Charles Spurgeon commenting on his favorite quotes from Thomas Manton. I believe that's what it is. And um, in it, there's this illustration. Uh, uh, he speaks in pictures, really. And he says, fellowship with God is the string upon which are placed all of our graces. And he says, if that sh string break, all, all your graces scatter on the ground. What a beautiful picture. What an easy picture to understand. And that is is a perfect understanding of fellowship with God's place in our lives. Upon it is placed all the graces that God gives to you. And if we live apart from fellowship, if we break that fellowship, all the graces scatter. Uh, so that's why it is so important um, to keep that string of fellowship attached. As you know, uh, Spurgeon had a goal in his life, and he, he wrote it down as unbroken communion, unbroken communion, always in communion with God. Uh, Paul tells us to pray without ceasing, which shows us prayer is more than words, because otherwise he'd just be encouraging a life of jibber-jabber. But he also says in everything, Philippians 4, in everything, by prayer, with thanksgiving, making your requests known to God. So you see this constant awareness of God. So you think about it like this, in everything by prayer, whatever it is in front of you, you turn it to God. I just, I turn this to you, Lord. 
I am aware of you in everything I do. If you haven't read the book, The Practice of the Presence of God, it's a great aid to inspire you to live underneath the sweet influences of his precious spirit. Um, this guy was a, uh, a monk and he was a dishwasher, basically like a janitor. And he lived in fellowship with God while he did mundane tasks. And he, he says statements like this in the book. He says, I found that love was the quickest way to God. <laughs> I love that. Love is the quickest way to God. <laughs> it reminds me also of Madame Guyon who said, prayer is the application of the heart to God. It's applying your heart to God. Just apply, my heart is applied to you. And then she says, and the inward exercise of love. Oh, how I love you. Oh, how I love you. And so Brother Lawrence says, you can pick up a straw to the glory of God if your heart is set on the face of Jesus Christ. Everything you do becomes worship because your heart is turned towards him. This is the string of fellowship. And we must keep it and cherish it and protect it. Realize it to be our highest priority in life. Because if that string break, all the graces scatter. Now, the third point is um, diamonds. So the first one was button, string, now diamond. Diamond, not diamonds, diamond. Turn over to um, First John. I'm going to show you this one. We're evangelists, man. I, I get it. But you are a bride first. <laughs> and from that, you preach Christ because you love Christ. So look at this, verse 3. John is writing this letter. You've read this many times. And he says this, um, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. So again, his experience. <laughs> John connects the gospel to his personal experience of this man. What we have seen, what we have heard, we proclaim to you. Well, here's the reason. So that. These two words are so important because they reveal the intent. They reveal the purpose of his whole letter. They reveal the whole purpose of the gospel. While he, why he's even preaching the gospel to them. What is the motive for the gospel? Well, it says here, so that you too may have, possess, fellowship, interactive, presence, exchange, enjoyment, fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So we see here that the gospel intent, the intent of preaching the gospel, you preaching the gospel, comes from you experiencing this man that you're telling the world. It's almost as if you're the, an evangelist says, come, let me tell you about my husband. <laughs> come, let me show you my husband. Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. <laughs> Why? Because she tasted him. She experienced him. Praise God. You know, it's interesting to me in that John chapter four, when Jesus is at the well with that woman and he, he tells her, you know, basically that he is the Messiah and she runs and tells everybody. And then because she told them, they all come back and they say, we believed because of what you said, but now we believe because we've seen him too. That's evangelism. Come and see this man because you've experienced this man. But it's also interesting to note that Jesus is at a well. <laughs> that should ring a bell. Why? Because um, Jacob met his wife at a, at a well, you know, um, and Abraham sends out his servant. Um, oh, no, no, sorry. Moses actually meets Zipporah at a well. So you have like wells are, are constant in the scripture, and they have to do in some cases with bride and bridegroom marriage. So it's almost like you can take the picture and look at Jesus at the well with this woman. He, he said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me to satisfy your soul. You would ask me to give you living water and that you would never thirst again. In other words, he's saying, I, if you marry me, I, if you let me be your husband, spiritually, he's saying, if you let me be your husband, then you'll never thirst again. That's why he says to her, where's your husband? 
<laughs> in other words, he's identifying her problem. She searched the whole world for a husband. And Jesus is saying, if you let me be your husband, if you let me be your bridegroom, you'll find everything that you need in me. So all this to say, this last point is that the gospel is for this reason, to bring others into the interactive, blissful, enjoyable exchange that you yourself have. Oh, it's so important that this be the reason, not just to save people from hell. Praise God. We're so happy about that, aren't you? And not just to bring people in into heaven. Praise God. We love the fact that one day we will be forever with the Lord in a place freedom, free from oppressions and darkness and sin. But even more than all of that, to know, to experience, to have the liberty of knowing God. Not just that knowing God gives you liberty from sin. That's, that's true. But there's a higher truth. And it's there's a liberty of knowing God. You're free from the bondage of not knowing him. Not just the bondage to sin from not knowing him, but also the bondage of not knowing him. He's given us understanding that we might know him. And that's the liberty of life. That's the sun setting you, you free. What is the freedom in? It is the freedom of knowing God. It's the restoration of what Adam lost in the garden. You know, I was praying the other day in here in this room, and I could have sworn I heard with my ears. Now, I, I know I didn't hear it with my ears, but it it really felt like it was audible. I And I knew what it was when I heard it. I heard this like, I can't even describe it. It was like a song, uh, not, not really a song, like, like somebody singing a note of mourning longing like a, a sound of longing love. And it, I can't even do it. It was this, this cry, oh, like this, oh, like a longing love. I could hear it. And I felt like what the Lord was showing me was Adam was longing for his God. He lost fellowship with his God. And he's crying out with song, oh, like he's longing for God again. And I could, I could feel the response of the Lord with the same sound. Whoa! You know, looking for man, longing for man. This, this craving on both sides. Adam longs for his lost God. And God longs for his lost man that they might find uh, one another. Um, I just read from C.H. McIntosh. He said, God showed his power by making man from dust, but he showed his grace by searching for him when he was lost. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I say all this to say this is the purpose of the gospel. Now, why call it diamond? Well, imagine if I'm going to ask my wife to marry me and I kneel down and I say, you know, will you make me the happiest man in the world? You know, to steal a, a line from the notebook. Will you make me the happiest man in the world? And he and I, and I hand her the diamond or the sorry, I hand her the ring and there's no diamond. It's just prongs. And there's no center stone. <laughs> She'd be like, what, what is this? Oh, well, you know, uh, I forgot the central stone. It's the whole ring. It has a purpose of the central stone to hold the central stone. The ring is to keep the central stone on you. The prongs are to keep the central stone on the ring. The whole ring is for the central stone. <laughs> It's all about that diamond. And imagine me preaching a gospel that is just ring and prongs and not the death, which is this. God would find Adam and Adam would find God. That man would be restored into fellowship, praise God, with God. This is everything. And I believe this to be what John is trying to say in this first chapter, so that you too may have fellowship with us and our, our fellowship is with the Father and Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you so much for your precious glory. The manifest presence of Jesus Christ in the Spirit, we worship you. We praise you, Father. Thank you. Lord, I just ask for each one of my brothers and sisters there I just ask you that you would show them the button, the string, and the diamond. That they would live 
by these three things. Live by the button, the string, and the diamond. That they would always keep first thing first, enjoyment of Christ as the first button on the shirt. Get that right. Get that right. If, if, if In all thy getting, get this right. And Lord, number two, I pray that they would remember that this fellowship with you should be guarded and protected, knowing that if it break, all graces scatter, for upon you hang all things of your fullness. We have all received grace upon grace upon grace. Thank you. And Lord, I pray also, thirdly, that there would be a recognition of the diamond, the central stone, the purpose of the gospel, that man and God would enjoy fellowship one with another. In your precious name, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen.